Hi, everyone. I'm Cindy Bank. I'm the Associate Director of the Program in Practical Policy Engagement, and we're going to get started, even though I know that we'll have additional students who will be um, joining us as they tra um, tra transfer from their last classes onto another Zoom. Um, but I want to welcome everybody today, and I want to thank my um, colleague, M Miriam, who is in the background, um, helping us with all the tech. And later, um, Crystal, who is just stepped down as our SAC chair, will be moderating the Q&As. So thank you. And just as a reminder, this is being recorded, and um, we're really hoping that um, when we get to the Q and A's that everyone will, who's able to, will turn on their screens and ask their questions, or if not, you can put them in chat and Crystal will ask them. Um, I am not gonna do an introduction because Dexter's gonna talk about himself, but I really wanna welcome him. Um, I have to put this out front. Um, Dexter is basically my son from another mother. And I met him when he was still an undergrad it's quite a few years ago, but not that long ago. And um, I remember the first phone call I had with him. I was standing in the Rayburn cafeteria and he called me and just asked so many really delving questions into what life and work was like in DC because that's where he was coming. So um, he's really become a close friend, a mentor to my son and has had an incredible career so far at a very young age in truly serving the public and um, even though he's working for a for-profit company now, it's really what he's doing is really focused on the public good. And he continues even in his private life to um, continue in public service. So um, Dexter, please take it away. No, thank you, Cindy, for the kind introduction. And I remember that conversation via phone and in person. So I'll, as I kind of go through the arc of my early career, it was not that long ago, but still some time. Uh, but I, I will definitely go through kind of that moment as well, I think is relevant for today's conversation about service. But thank you all for having me. It's definitely an honor and privilege to be here and speak to, to you all. I'm Dexter Mason. I am a proud U of M alum as well. Even though I was not in the Ford School, I definitely used to walk by the school all the time, uh, especially going up that hill on State Street. So definitely beautiful building, beautiful space. But just a little bit more about me. I'm a native of Metro Detroit. I grew up in Gross Point right outside Detroit. I'm calling in from Detroit now, so I'm a proud Detroit resident for the last uh, five, five and a half years, but um, grew up in Gross Point Public Schools, K through 12, and then entered the University of Michigan in fall 2009. Uh, 2009. Um, I was in the School of Kinesiology, uh, sport management major, so that major focused really on the business side of sports. And so growing up, I really had aspirations of going to the NBA, wanted to play professional basketball, had hoop dreams, as a lot of folks call it. And for me, uh, my height and my weight allowed me not to become an NBA player. I was cut from my seventh grade basketball team in middle school. And my parents, you know, told me, hey, you will not be the next Michael Jordan. And that's OK. But you can own a team. You can run a team. You can come, you can work for a team. And so for me, that opened up my you know, career outlook that I can still work in sports, but with Without being an athlete. And so for me, as I kind of matriculated to the University of Michigan, that's why I picked U of M for the athletics, obviously the academics, but the fact that the School of Kinesiology offered a sport management program. But during that time too, um, kind of going back to right before Michigan, my senior year, my senior year in high school coincided with President Obama's uh, historical election in 2008. And then for me being a black male and seeing a um, the first black president being elected really had a profound effect on me um, for the rest of my life um, and into this day today. And so as I you know, went to Michigan, wanted to work in sports, on the back of my mind, because of President Obama's historical election, I really wanted to find a way to intersect sports and politics. Uh, at my time on campus, I was mostly active in kind of the sport business community. I was president of the Sport Business Association on campus. I also was a, a student manager for the men's basketball team uh, all my four years when I was on campus. Uh, my senior year in college in 2013 uh, coincided with our final Final Four run uh, for the men's basketball program, where ultimately we lost a national championship game. 
And so for me, it was, you know, heartbreaking loss, but once again, really, you know, profound uh, impact in my life. Uh, but during that time, as we're thinking about graduation, what I want to do after graduate uh, graduation, I want to find a way to find a way to really still work in sports. But also at the same time, my senior year in college was uh, President Obama's re-election in 2012. During my four years at U of M, I think President Obama came to campus three times as a commencement speaker um, and also during his, uh, his campaign. And so for me, once again, how can I, you know, intersect, you know, my passion for sports and politics. For me, I didn't believe those two worlds really collided. And, 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 and at that time, I took no, you know, I did not take any uh, forward classes, any classes in LSNA within the political science realm. So for me, I was very, very lost. And as President Obama was elected for the second time, that's where I knew I want to some find a way to get to DC. Did not know how, didn't have a roadmap, did not have any guidance. And that's where Cindy Bank uh, came in. As a lot of folks on Michigan's campus really told me, you need to reach out to Cindy, you need to reach out to Sydney. And so I called her, as she mentioned in the intro, she was like walking in, in the Rayburn building uh, on Capitol Hill. And I was a lost college student and trying to figure out how to get to DC post-graduation. And so I was very fortunate to attend the second um, uh, inauguration for President Obama in 2013 in January. And that's where I actually got a chance to meet Cindy and kind of tell me the roadmap on how to enter, you know, enter politics, how especially leverage University of Michigan network to get there. There's a lot of alum uh, that are there as well that we all know. And so as I was graduating college, I actually applied for a one, a one year master's program at Georgetown. It was a master's in sports management. So very similar to my academics here at U of M for undergrad, but the program allowed me to get to DC. Um, the program also allowed me to work or intern during the day and all my classes were in the evening. So for me, wow, I can finally, you know, hopefully, you know, find a way to um, intersect both of my passions and interests in service and in sports. And so as I um, you know, moved to, got into the Georgetown program, graduated U of M, moved to DC in fall 2013 and ended up having a unpaid internship on Capitol Hill for my congressman at the time, Gary Peters. And so as I went through my 18 uh, month program at Georgetown, I was very fortunate to intern at, um, for, Senate, or for Congressman Peters at the time. I interned at the NCAA in their government relations office. That was also the same time that student athletes at Northwestern University were trying to unionize um, to be paid. Um, so ha having that conversation in 2014 is definitely very interesting. Now, now college athletes are able to, you know, make money off their likeness. Obviously, there's a very contentious conversation that I was part of back in 2014, working for the NCAA. Uh, after that experience, I ended up uh, interning for uh, the NFL Players Association in their public policy department. That NFL Players Association was actually the union for the NFL players. And they were actually sp supporting the student athletes at Northwestern at that time. So for me, I was actually able to get kind of a, uh, a 180 or 360 perspective of both, of both sides of the issue there. Uh, my last semester of, of, of graduate school at Georgetown coincided with um, I was able to get the White House internship. And so this internship uh, with President Obama, I applied, I think this was my fourth time uh, applying and fourth time getting it. I applied a handful of times when I was an undergrad at Michigan, applied for a couple of times in graduate school. So my fourth and final time, I was able to maybe do this internship. I was I was had the really uh, the privilege to actually be accepted into the program and end up interning for um, yeah, for the Obama administration in fall 2014. Uh, during that time, I was interning in the Office of Public Engagement. Uh, the uh, person who ran that office was Valerie Jarrett, who was a University of Michigan law alum. And so it was a really great experience where I worked on the, on the private sector engagement team. And I was able really to understand how President Obama's administration uh, really partnered with the private sectors, whether it's Silicon Valley, um, CEO, small businesses, the Treasury Department, et cetera, in order to um, spur economic opportunity, competitiveness, and also expand President Obama's agenda, whether it's raising a minimum wage, decreasing the gender pay gap, um, and expanding family, you know, family leave. And so those are those issues that we're, I know we're still fighting for in our society, but it was really great to kind of see the, there's different ways to solve problems. There's the you know, government and also the private sector in order to work hand in hand, hopefully to solve some of these societal issues. Um, as I you know, graduated from Georgetown that fall and ended my internship at the White, uh, White House, 
I was looking for a job. I was looking for an opportunity, um, you know, was really, was really, um, you know, glad I was in DC, but really trying to figure out what my next steps were. Um, during that time, my congressman ended up being uh, elected to the U.S. Senate, Gary Peters, and just ma you know maintain relationships with their chief of staff, who was a U of M alum, and other um, staff members in uh, on on his staff. I was able to become one of his first staff assistants in D.C. So I ended up working there for about nine, 10 months on the Hill. I got to see Cindy all the time. Um, and that experience also was really um, you know, profound. That was also, I was there the same time and only a few blocks over when Supreme Court um, had the ruling, historical ruling uh, of gay marriage being the, the land, of, the law of the land and be able to, and having that great moment of running from our Senate offices to the Supreme Court and celebrating that historical ruling in landmark case. After you know nine ten months being working for uh, Senator Peters, I end up actually working back at the White House in White House operations, uh, working on large events that happened on the White House complex as a staff assistant. So that 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 meant events such as. Um, Pope Francis coming to visit the White House to um, sports teams they won championships visiting Easter egg roll. Um, so my responsibilities are very, very um, generalist, um, but really great experience of really work with the pub, you know, having the public come to the people's house, uh, which was the White House and really engaging with everyday Americans and just seeing their faces when they come to to the White House on different levels of engagement. Uh, obviously, my time was, you know, I was a, a political appointee for President Obama at that time, and so I was going to be out of a job regardless who won in the 2016 election. And so as I, you know, really loved my experience in public, in the public sector and public service, I really miss working in sports. And so once again, kind of going back to the Michigan difference and our strong alumni base throughout the whole, whole campus and whole university, I was able to tap back into my, um, you know, sport management alumni base and get connected to a organization that was just starting at that time. It was RISE, uh, the Ross Initiative in Sports for Equality. It was an organization that uh, partnered with the sports community um, um, to use the power of sports to improve race relations. Um, it was started by Stephen Ross, as we all know, the, the, the building right around the corner from the Ford School. And so he founded this organization using the power of sports for good. And every single league commissioner, the head of each sports league was on the board of directors. And so I joined, I joined that organization in July 2016. And then about a month later, Colin Kaepernick, uh, Colin Kaepernick started uh, started kneeling, and so we all kind of kind of saw the intersection of athletes using their platform for change, sports organizations using their platform for change, and, and then you know kind of seeing that intersection and be in the middle of that was really a dream job uh, for me as we kind of talk about the beginning of my career and what I wanted to do post graduation. Uh, of course, we all know a few months after uh, Colin Kaepernick started kneeling, uh, President Trump was elected. And so once again, we kind of saw the, the intersection, the rise of athlete activism or the resurgence or renaissance of athlete activism and me being in the middle of those conversations and events and all those, all those engagements for, for three years. Um, that included um, you know, making sure student athletes at U of M are registered to vote, partnering with the Chicago Cubs on events, working with the NFL and the NBA and all these leagues and athletes on uh, community police reform, et cetera. Uh, after three, my three years there, I actually transitioned out of RISE and joined the Kresge Foundation. I know one of your alum actually is not my successor, um, uh, Christopher LaFleur, and so, you know, strong, and a strong forward, forward school ties there, but um, at the Kresge Foundation, Kresge is a national foundation based in Troy, Michigan, so about an hour or so from Ann Arbor's campus, is an organization that I think gives about I think almost like $300 million per year in grants in order to uh, you know, support American cities and, and, and the work in American cities since 80% of the US population lives in or near a, uh, a US city. And so my role at Kresge, I reported to the president CEO Rip Rapson and managing special projects for him for about two years. Obviously during that time, we saw the historical 2020 election. We saw the historical 2020 with the horrific murder of George Floyd. And I was really privileged and fortunate enough to really help um, with Kresge designing what our racial justice package was, where we gave about over, we designed and architect about $30 million going out to different grassroots organizations and organizers on racial justice on the front lines throughout American cities and a lot in Detroit as well. So for me to kind of lead that project from A to, a to Z during that time was definitely a privilege and something that I'm still tracking to this day when talking to my former colleagues there. 
And so now my last destination where I am today, and I definitely want to open up the questions. And um, I'm currently now working for my first for-profit entity, um, Buzzard Media Company. So the first time I've ever worked in my career, um, you know, full-time for a, a for-profit. Um, Buzzard is a, a technology startup. It's a sports media app that allows fans to sign in, put their, you know, indicate their favorite sports teams and leagues to watch and athletes to watch. And you actually get a notification to your phone when amazing things are going to happen in sports, when it's five minutes left, tied game, tune in now, bottom of the ninth inning, tune in now, and you actually get the notification, click on it, and you're able to kind of see that that moment live in, in real time. Um, a lot of times you, you notice sports highlights is usually after a moment happens. We're trying to get the moment before. And so for me, it kind of goes back to my ethos of working in sports and politics and social change in, in public good. And so my role is actually leading the social impact work and D and I work for Buzzard. Uh, in that role, I've actually designed what is called our impact model at Buzzard. Uh, we have we committed 1% of our company's equity, our net sales, our consumer user engagement, and also our employee volunteer time um, um, for social justice and economic justice. Um, so we want to make sure that's, you know, this, this work is in the core of the business. Um, along with the DNI efforts that we have internally. Uh, we have a mentorship program that pairs over 500 mentees with mentors, majority from HBCUs, and a lot of other suites of engagement um, that we're doing. So even though I am working for a for-profit, I'm definitely you know, learning a lot. It's definitely very fast paced. We're in year two of the company, so very early, but I'm excited that I'm here at the ground, at the ground level and really building up how can startups really can you know, what the blueprint for startups, you can make money and you also can do, do, do good at the same time. It's not mutually exclusive. And that's what I'm learning every day in this role. So I will pause there with introduction. Uh, I know that was very long, but wanted to make sure hopefully that it provided some good context for our discussion today. So thank you once again for allowing me to be here. Hey, thanks, Doctor. Before I turn this over to Crystal, I just want to make a point of, um, as you were going through your career, and I think um, for students, you often hear about the Michigan difference and um, using your Michigan contacts. So um, Dexter mentioned he worked for Congressman Peters, whose chief of staff was a U of M alum. At the NFL Players Association, there was a U of M alum. At the NCAA DC office, um, the assistant director there was a U of M alum. Yep. The Office of Public Engagement at the White House was run by a U of M alum. So mm -hmm. never underestimate the contact or never, you should always reach out, use, use your Michigan contacts. They're really incredible. No, thank oh, you. So you. Yeah. And, and I, I got to give you credit. You were the, you were the foundation for that. So a lot of folks you connected me with, so do not underestimate Cindy Bank as well. So thank you. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Doctor, for sharing your story. I know um, it was really great just hearing all of the different factors that led to you pursuing different activities and like how it really impacted your journey. Um, I know, especially with my generation, our generation, right, there's this idea of constantly looking for the next thing and like not being afraid to try new things. And so wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that of like, um, what was that process like of having to decide to sort of pivot and um, any recommendations that you have for us as we're um, seeking either internships that may be in a different field than what we, where we came from or pursuing jobs that are different um, from what our background uh, is. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, for me, I didn't, you know, I could not, if I would have predicted even a year or two ago, I would not have been at Buzzer. I never thought it was a company. It was not a company at that time, two years ago, essentially. And so for me, I always take opportunities that allow me to grow personally and professionally. Like, what am I looking for in my next chapter? I know that the times where I can speak for my grandparents and even some of my aunts and uncles where they graduated high school here in Detroit, worked at you know, whether Ford or Chrysler General Motors in the plant, and they worked for 40 years and they retired and had a pension. I know those days, unfortunately, are not there in, in terms of having a, a steady middle, you know, middle class um, lifestyle. And so for me, I just knew that I always wanted to find things that allow me to grow personally, professionally, as I mentioned. I knew I was not going to be at an organization for the rest of my life. And so, but also, how can I? Um, you know, grow in those aspects, whether it's leadership growth, whether it's 
you know, can it maybe a salary increase, um, whatever those um, challenges, like I've never worked in technology before. I was interested in it, did not know about it, but this was a great opportunity for me to explore it and, you know, do something I've never done before. I'm now leading a social impact arm. I developed the budget. I developed a three-year strategic plan. I designed it. I've never done these type of things before. And so for me, I knew this opportunity was going to stretch me to places that were going to flex new muscles, discover muscles I did not have and really challenge me every single day. And so as I look at opportunities, there's definitely the growth, as I mentioned, personally, professionally, but also every role I've taken, I always want to make sure it was like, I'm always serving in that role. I'm the company or what role I'm doing is always giving back to the communities that look like me or that don't look like me. Who's not, who's not in the room, who's not at the table. So for me, whatever role I've ever taken has always been about, you know, how to use that platform, use that entity, using that role um, for a larger societal good. And that was always been the common theme, regardless is in the public or private sector. Yeah, um, I I think jumping off of that last point of the role of the public sector, right, and even with this new world you're in of uh, driving partnerships and social impact, which, which I think is also sort of a new field that a lot of companies are trying to expand and right um, really come um, bring to the forefront because this is a really important topic that I think a lot of new employees um, are really paying attention to, and so. Um, I know you were speaking earlier of how when you were joining um, Rise and then, you know, the activism was coming from athletes. And so now you're a buzzer and there's also sort of this growing field of social impact. And so what is that like of sort of being um, on the, at the forefront of all that? And um, do you think, what do you think your role is in terms of also helping other, um, others pursue that similar field? Yeah, no, I think there needs to be more of us. I think that my, one thing I always looked at, and I, whether you're in a private or public sector, there's just so many way, ways to serve. I think that there's, when you, when you look at societal issues, whether it is the student loan crisis, whether it is climate change, whether it is, um, you know, racial in, injustice and inequity, um, you know, policing, and all these topics that we've been advocating for centuries and decades, right? I feel like there's not a silver bullet solution, because there was, a, hopefully there would have, there already would have been one. So I just noticed that, that it takes multiple players in order to, and sectors that come together to solve these very kind of complex issues. I was very fortunate to have the experience in government and in foundation. I, I working at Kresge really opened a whole nother way, the role that foundation foundations, major, you know, uh, private foundations play in this, in this, and then also now, you know, in, in, in the, in the, for, you know, for the for-profit. And so for me, I'd ask like how it feels. I mean, for me, I'm learning every single day, but I really want to get more of us into this space in terms of folks who come from more, I guess, nonprofit government space. I think that we all have a role in here. And so my goal is like, as I build out my team and hire more people, I want to be able to bring, you know, folks that come from more, you know, grassroots mobilizing that understand what community needs are um, and be hopeful to bring that kind of that spirit into um, a company, especially where I am now. We're very early. We have 60 full-time people like every person we bring really affects the culture of the organization and so for me if I bring in more folks like that I think it might help you know just shape the, the work that we're doing every single day um secondly too I think a lot of these you know especially big tech you look at they have a lot of these charity arms whether it's google twitter facebook um I think it's meta now they're called but you know they definitely have all these charity arms which is doing great work but if you look at their board of directors you look at their senior c-suite you see their engineers is not you know, there's not a lot of women, not a lot of women of color, people of color in these roles. So for me, yeah, there's the impact side where we're like, you know, donating, drawing awareness for a lot of these great work and nonprofits. But internally, if we don't, you know, we can say Black Lives Matter, but if our board and our leadership and our team does not look like that, then there's no, it's, it's you lose instant credibility. So that's why I kind of, I'm grateful I'm serving kind of the external facing social impact work, but also internal leading d &I as well, because I want to make sure we're walking the talk as well. Um, and looking and examining you know, examining uh, not just our team, but also we have investors, like we have VC investors. I'm worried about that process. You know, the whole VC getting millions of dollars, you know, how can we get that 
capital to you know minority owned businesses. Um, I'm looking how can we get more minorities to be investors of Buzzer so we can create generational wealth when um, you know when the company hopefully becomes big, whether it's going public or whatever that looks like in the future. Well, the fact that outcome looks like hopefully can we create generational wealth there? Then we look at our board of directors as well, making sure that's reflective. So and also even honestly the sports that we're offering on our app, we're making sure we're highlighting women's sports. We have the NBA and the WNBA on our app now. How can we get more other sports on there? Maybe highlighting more HBCUs as well in terms of um, getting more exposure to them in other women's sports. So it's an equity issue. So there's a lot of things where, yes, there's the social impact arm, but I think we could do a lot of things internally as well. And I'm really grateful to have a great CEO um, in Bohan at, at Buzzard who is very passionate about justice. He's really led by his spirituality in that regard. And he really feels like we, Buzzer could be a blueprint of how startups should be um, created and not just having charity and this DNI work 10 years after the company's been founded. Yeah, um, I I appreciate you naming the, the importance of the internal work, right? I think that's definitely, um, I think something that probably we have all experienced in some shape or form or, right, or seeing how it can really, to your point, sometimes not match what is being said. And so it, it's exciting to hear that there's somebody like you and in, in that position to really drive that work forward. And so that's really exciting. Um, and I also know that the work is not easy, right? Especially for um, for people who identify sometimes part of those communities. And so um, I know, you know, in a previous role, like I was the only like woman of color as well. And so it's just definitely challenging at times. Um, yeah. And one of the questions that was submitted was, um, do you have feelings of burnt out related to DEI work, uh, especially with such a large um, non non POC audience? And so yeah. how do you how do you reconcile that um, in terms of driving the work forward and taking care of yourself? Yeah. But also trying to be urgent, um, because to your yeah. point, right, we are sort of in this this pivotal moment. Yeah, it's actually a really good question. I'm glad you asked or whoever and you know who submitted that question. It's a really good question. I think it's something everybody's in these roles. I think especially in 2020, you kind of go back to that in the horrific murder of George Floyd. I mean, I had so many black and brown friends who were working in corporate spaces or any entity where like they're not a DNI team, they're not on the people operation the HR team. They're working in their traditional corporate roles and then they're getting tasked to, hey, we need a response to you know, to this, what should we do? They're going to like the black employee resource group or whatever groups they have internally. And they were, there was a lot of burden, a lot of burnout. You know, a lot of my friends who were in these structures did not even get compensated for the additional work. It's not their day-to-day -day responsibility. So we saw a lot of that in 2020 and even well before that, but I think that was definitely heightened um, because of the events in society. And yeah, yeah, it's definitely a balance. Um, one thing I know my girlfriend's on a call as well. We talk about, you know, self-care often and really what I look in this role is honestly, is it's a you know, a blessing and not a burden. I think I have a responsibility. I'm in this role for a, a reason. I, I feel like, you know, I do try to find, you know, quiet time to take care of myself, whether it's meditating and um, getting physical activity and drinking wine. I love wine. So in terms of there's definitely the self-care there, but no, it definitely could be burning out. And one thing I'm really fortunate, once again, having a great CEO and founder and leader, it's I, you know, I tell him he's the chief diversity officer. Yeah, I lead strategy and some execution, but this is a shared responsibility. Um, it's not should be on one person, one team. This is a shared responsibility. I want to make sure the strategy I laid out is that every single person at Buzzard has a responsibility in driving this culture and this work forward from our engineers to our product team to our senior level to entry level people. That's something that we are advocate. That's not every company's not like that, unfortunately, but I really think that if you are, if my advice would be if anybody is having that that burden um, put on them, hopefully they're getting compensated for that, that is responsibility. If not, hopefully finding these spaces, whether it's within your company or outside your company to take care of yourself because this work is hard. Um, it is ever, it's every day and it's not, it's not going to end, but how can we, you know, you know, Dr. King said famously, how can we kind of move the, the arc of justice forward, right? And bending it forward toward justice, right? And so uh, I, that's what, you know, I, when I look back at my reflecting on my life, as long as I know I did my best, that's what I, you know, I'm happy about that. Thank you for, for that response and um, highlighting the importance of self-care. Like definitely, I think um, that's been a lesson for all of us during this global yes. pandemic, especially. So yeah. that, um, we're still, that, we're that we're still yeah, in, that we're still, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> that we're still, still that we're navigating. Still on year three, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, um, I see Maya put a question um, in the chat. And so um, as someone whose career has spanned sectors, what insights do you have about the unique challenges and opportunities that exist in each sector as they relate to advancing goals of DEI and social justice? Um, and based on your experience, how can these sectors best collaborate? Yeah, that's a really good question. I really appreciate that question, Maya. But I guess I'll start with the second question first. Like, as I mentioned, I've worked in government, now private, and also foundations. I think everybody plays a different role. Obviously, I, I think I, we think you all, you know, being forward students, we all know that government is the 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 strongest and best and most effective way to make change and effective change and, and impact the most people. So that's always going to be the most powerful lever in the toolkit um, that, that, that we should be using. But in addition to that, I, I think private sector plays a role in terms of like job creation, obviously, um, you know, providing more opportunities, hopefully investing back in the communities that they're in um, and hopefully being, you know, with climate change and all these things. And hopefully, you know, those companies are trying to be net zero now. And I think there's responsibility since, you know, so many, uh, you know, companies pump out so much, uh, you know, uh, carbon and everything emission into the to the world. So I do think there's responsibility there. And even you're seeing a lot of car companies, a lot of um, emphasis on electrical vehicles too, especially here in Michigan too. So hopefully that provides a little more. So there's a role in that we're using products every day. We are getting a paycheck every day. So hopefully these private sector plays a more responsible role in that effort. And then foundations, what I learned at the Kresge Foundation, which is so interesting, and I did not know candidly, I've never worked for a, a private foundation before that and, and didn't understand how it worked. What Kresge, at least I can speak for Kresge Foundation, Kresge Foundation was a, what we did, we also, we planted a lot of seeds. Like, hey, what's, this is an innovative way of looking at reinvesting in neighborhoods or looking at supporting small businesses in X city or whatever. I really thought that was very unique where like, hey, what's, what's kind of like use a startup mentality? What's pump investment and money in this? See if it works, get the learnings. And hopefully from there, it will be enough for maybe the government to implement on a lot larger level. So I started noticing like different roles where like foundations maybe can, you know, I think government sometimes can, can't be as innovative as they want for many reasons, but I think one of it is because of lack of resources being allocated to other places where I think private foundations and private sectors can help maybe spur some of these really interesting ideas where I think are needed, for example, universal you know, uh, income. And that's been such a trend through a lot of American cities now. A lot of foundations and corporations are exploring that, pumping into foundations that are really working cities to study what universal you know, income looks like. And I really think hopefully based on these findings, I think we all know the impact of it and the positive impact that hopefully now we have some you know, solid base on this can work. What scale, and that's when the government comes in, what's make instead of citywide, let's make it statewide or countywide or countrywide. And so that's where I kind of see all the different uh, sectors kind of work hand in hand um, concretely. But I guess, I, and then challenges opportunities really quickly to answer your first question, Maya. I mean, yeah, there's definitely challenge opportunities. I look at opportunities more than anything, just like, once again, how can we problem solve? And once again, I don't think pro solving a complex uh, problem has one solution only. So therefore I just really am grateful that the wealth of diverse spirits I've had hopefully allows me to kind of understand a, a little bit what um, what the other sector is doing, what the right hand is doing, what the left hand is doing, and really provide some, uh, some solutions um, for that work. Um, yeah, it's, it's exciting to hear more, a little bit more about the role of foundations. I know that's also, I think, um, something that not all of us are, really know about. So thank you for sharing um, that piece of, you know, them being part of the conversation and hopefully planting seeds for, for new work or innovative work. That's like really exciting to hear. Um, and so in terms of, you know, the multitude of experiences you've had, um, wondering if you can share like maybe some of the challenges or like the lessons learned that you've encountered so that we can um, hear about, you know, your journey as, as we're beginning to continue our, or beginning our careers or continuing our careers and so that we can take uh, your lessons with us. I think the challenge is I think we all know this change takes time. <laughs> I think change takes time. Sometimes you don't see the fruits of your labor. You might see the fruits of your labor after you leave, right? And so that's the hardest thing. But I do believe in you continuing to like push it forward and plant the seeds. I think you'll see fruits of your labor in time. So I think one thing is I think just being patient, being patient. I think we all want to see where we are society and culture now instant instant gratification. We want to see like 
the work that we're doing make an immediate impact. We want to see the communities that have been suffering for decades and centuries to, you know, be better and 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 be more empowered and have the more resources. So I think that's the biggest challenge because you know every day people are struggling to find transportation or get to school, get to work safely, having masks. Like we see it every single day and it's hard. We're like, we're seeing these day-to-day -day things, but it doesn't, the problem solving is not as quick as that. And so I think that's the biggest like challenge every day have that mentality. Uh, for example, when I, when I was working in philanthropy, like we did grants on a monthly basis, which is great. We gave a lot of money, but a lot of times, like I never got to see like the work, like what, what do we do with the grant money? I never got a chance really to see that many grantees and, you know, the impact of our investment and just seeing what they're doing. Cause we're really so far removed uh, from that work. Um, when I worked, you know, at the White House or in Capitol Hill, that's, you're kind of an ivory tower in a sense. You're on the hill and you think the whole world around, revolves around DC, which is not true. Um, one kind of quick thing, we're kind of from, from a perspective um, base. I remember when I did move back from DC to Detroit and um, that was summer 2016. So obviously it was the heat of a um, historical election between Senator Clinton and, and at that time, you know, uh, uh, Donald Trump. And to be candid with you, living in DC, I lived in New York for a little bit. I lived in Ann Arbor. And so for me, I was in a bubble. I did not, I thought it was a, the, can't, I know, you know, this is a, a safe space in the audience. I thought it was a joke that, um, you know, Trump was running. I didn't think it was a real, like, I didn't really, it was a real thing. I literally, you know, in DC, we all laughed about it, went to happy hours, played bingo games about it. And I didn't realize how real it was until I moved back to Michigan, saw abundance of Trump signs all over where I grew up in Gross Point to different um, communities in the Metro Detroit area. And I did not realize that. And so for me, I think that's the number thing. What I learned the most is that like perspective taking. Yeah, I lived in a lot of bubbles and, and, and was kind of an ivory tower in a sense. And that's one thing I want to learn more and continue to do in my career is making sure that with the communities that we're, I'm trying to serve and help and uplift, um, not just by myself, but just in the roles I'm in, I'm, you know, trying to really understand and hear and learn what their needs are, what's going on, and not kind of live in this, you know, kind of elite bubble that I was on in, at Michigan on campus to being in DC and then even being at, 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 at you know, Kresge, even Buzzer now. So my thing is I kind of get myself out of that bubble um, and have better perspective. Um. Thank you for for sharing that and for also highlighting how impactful I think like that election was for so many of us and I um, I definitely agree that you're not alone and you know uh, how <laughs> that just you know that candidacy played out and uh, the the result of that election um, I know hearing from classmates that was also a big factor for why they came back to graduate school of like okay I want to join the fight now I want to be part yeah. of um, you know, serving uh, the public. And so I, I know you were serving and then now you're sort of not uh, with the foundations and now you're in the for profit sector. And so um, any advice or words of wisdom for, for students who are considering joining um, the public sector, right, to going and going for office. And um, because we know that they, we are in a, in a reckoning moment right now of yeah. uh, how important it is to your point of diversifying also the elected positions. Yeah, uh, you're saying uh, advice for going to the public sector? Is that yeah, you know, I know you interned at the White House yeah. for a couple of years yeah. and so like um, speaking more to that experience. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I definitely advice. I mean, I think just being patient. I do think government experience, and I know Cindy really taught me that when our first phone call almost in 2012, so about 10 years ago now, to almost to the date, exactly, which is crazy, 10 years ago. But that conversation, I think public sector experience is the best experience. I think it like it helped in terms of like problem solving and being complex and serving others. I really believe like anybody, I always like when people do, I, when I talk to students, like undergrad students that are I'm thinking about DC, should I make the jump or working in Lansing or whatever your state capital is, or even your cities, like working locally here in Detroit, the mayor's office or city council, I'm like, yes, 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 and yes. I always believe government work is probably the most challenging yet rewarding experience. Yes, is it tough? I really feel like I always take a lot of lessons from my time as an intern on the Hill to working full-time on the Hill to interning at the White House and working full-time at the White House. I take a lot of those um, experiences to this day and also relationships I build. You're in an environment where, Everybody there is part of the fight. 
Um, we're all kind of like in the struggle together, but I really think, you know, it's a powerful experience. I'm, those are some of the best friends I've made um, working in, in in the public sector where I still, I talk to in every single day, even I have not been uh, in the government in about five years. So yes, anybody wants to make the jump, please do at some point in your life. That's a big, huge endorsement. And last, I think, yeah, we definitely need more, you know, public official, better, better elected officials. Obviously, I think we all know that as well. The importance on all levels uh, of government. So, hey Dexter, um, yeah. thinking about getting like being in public, um, can you share a little bit about the experience? I forgot what the exact program. You were part of the bipartisan leadership um, program. So in case we have students who are going to stay in Michigan. Um, about that program and what you took away from that. It's a, go ahead, I'll let you talk. Oh yeah, no, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I was gonna think about talking about public, yeah, about running for office, but yeah. So through Michigan State, I know it's unfortunately is the other, other school. <laughs> um, no, Michigan State does have a great program called the Michigan, Little, Michigan Political Leadership Program, MPLP. Uh, I think, I'm not sure Gabby went through, I know the first speaker, but I know I have a lot of uh, friends and a lot of civic leaders here in Detroit have gone through this program. It's this 12 month program, um, as Cindy talked about, uh, it's bipartisan. So it's 24 people in the cohort. Um, I think it's 12, it's 12 Democrats, 12 Republicans. Um, there might be a mix of independents as well, but they do group in, from all over the state of Michigan. So you have folks that are kind of representing Metro Detroit and more of the urban areas to folks that are more rural Michigan as well. So they put you in this program where once a month you go to a different part of Michigan, Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, very up north of places I've never been to before. And you go through to kind of like this leadership development and it really supposed to train us to run for public office in the future. So you learn about uh, how to, you know, do media training, how you build out your own campaign, uh, your campaign plan, uh, messaging, fundraising. So it was a really great experience where, and then also like they're putting people together that really you would never think, you know, would be hopefully the goal. The whole point is trying to really promote more bipartisanship. And I actually made some really great friends from the program like that are that maybe not, you know, uh, um, I agree with on every political ideology, but some really great people who have been elected are um, um, since then um, in their hometowns. But I also like I saw that program actually gave me more hope about our future and our country and leaders. When there's programs like that, where yeah, they might not be identified as, as as identify, but I know that they're working as hard as they can to make the country better in their own way. So I'm definitely very encouraged. I definitely encourage people who are staying in Michigan to apply for a Michigan Political Leadership Program in PLP. Um, like I said, you meet once a month um and i was i was in 2019 so i was the last class before the pandemic uh i think they did virtual last year i think this year they're trying to do like a hybrid so i'm not sure but really great program definitely a lot of michigan alum have gone through that and um it's okay you, you're not at michigan state's campus that much so uh you're definitely different parts but it was really really great experience and highly recommended That's great. I, I hadn't even heard of that program. So yeah, thanks, Cindy. Uh, <laughs> um, so I know right now, um, you know, there's a lot of activity happening even um, even in sports. And I know that's sort of, you know, your your area of expertise. And so um, what are there like any topics or certain um, movements that you think are going to be become really relevant. Um, I know there's like some talk with, you know, the Beijing Olympics and, um, you know, the, the World Cup. And so like um, any, any themes there or any topics that maybe we should um, begin thinking about as we're thinking more about this, um, the role to your point, right, of like DEI and social impact and uh, corporate responsibility. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, historically, it's always so funny where people say, like, you know, kind of show up and show up and dribble. That was a famous quote. You know, I forgot uh, her name on the journalist's name on Fox News who said that in relation to to LeBron James when, during his advocacy over the last several years. But I always think sports and politics are intertwined. They're always going to be. I mean, we say, you know. People say the national anthem before a game. So right there, already right there, right, is political in itself in terms of allegiance. But I mean, you always go back to even back in the, the early uh, 20th century with Jesse Owens in the Berlin Olympics and kind of, uh, you know, protesting against Hitler at that time. And we saw the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City with John Carlos and, you know, kind of the raising the fist. You always are going to have 
that intersection. Um, sports is a very powerful, you know, thing uh, for change and also for leveling or putting more issues on the forefront through that platform. For example, as you mentioned, Crystal, the Beijing Olympics, the fact that we're, you know, we're, you know, the U.S. is protesting against the government. We're not bringing any, you know, anybody from the U.S. delegation or not going to attend these games. So that, that even shows there another kind of level, like that's our kind of protest and using sports for that. So long story short, I always feel like there's always going to be from an international level to um, a local level to statewide, nationwide, sports are always going to be kind of that, that pillar, whether to show economic and political power and dominance, um, to advocate for change. I mean, for example, kind of going back to the Beijing Olympics, 2008, when they hosted the Summer Olympics, that was a big deal for China. They were using the Olympics to show that, hey, we are a world power as well. We're a world economic power, political power, and we're going to show the world that. And so that was one of the major things where that's why a lot of these countries that are emerging or, you know, countries like Brazil, et cetera, a lot of these countries, BRIC countries in particular, India, Brazil, China, et cetera, um, are hosting these games to show certain, you know, power that they're trying to exert. Doesn't, I'm not sure if it's true behind the curtains, as we all know, but it shows there. One thing I'm kind of looking forward to moving forward is like, as these conversations always happen, I really just hope there's more diversity in terms of like ownership and leadership in sports. Um, for example, right now in the National Football League, um, they had a, a, a suite of firing of coaches goes end of the season. And now there's only one black coach in the NFL out of all 32 teams. The NFL is 70% black um, in terms of players, but only one black head coach. There is only one black team president. There are zero black owners. And so those where I think where the real change needs to happen, it kind of goes back to my ethos at Buzzard. Yes, you can do a lot of this great social impact work, giving money to the communities, but look at your ownership, look at your leadership. If your house is not in order, you know, in house, like then for me, it's just lip service. It is just another charity arm. If you want to make real change, hopefully there's more leadership in terms of diversity, um, especially in women's sports, et cetera, too. So it's just, yes, I do hopefully see the trend where there's just more ownership there. But now what I love seeing too, from the college athlete side, now college athletes are now able to make money off their image and likeness and name. So they're getting more, you know, finally some equity in some standpoint there where a lot of these universities are making billions of dollars off the bodies of black and brown athletes. Um, and so I, I'm glad that there's some empowerment there. And then also professional athletes like LeBron James and a lot of our great women athletes are now really becoming owner part owners of teams. Um, at, you know, they're making, um, you know, a lot of millions of dollars and owning their own content, owning their own companies, investing in companies, taking equity instead of just endorsing, hey, no, I want ownership of this company too. I do not just want to just be in a commercial and get paid X amount for it. No, I want to grow as this company grows. I want to create generational wealth too. So for example, at Buzzer, we do have a handful, of, like we have Naomi Osaka is an investor of ours. Um, we have Michael Jordan is an investor of ours. So we definitely have a lot of folks who are, you know, big names, big household names that are invested in our company. And we want to bring more of that diversity um, into the fold. That's that's super exciting to hear that you have those uh, big name investors and um, yeah I that that piece of generational wealth really stood out to me as well and I know how important that is especially given the high um, income inequality that we have in this country unfortunately and so it's um, I think you're totally right that there is sort of this um, bigger trend and movement right of um, of individuals knowing that like pushing for what, what they're worth and the work that they're creating right like um to your point right like student athletes like driving so much um attention and and money to to their campuses and so i think you're totally right um and uh oh, i'm losing my train of thought um i was curious about the the role i guess of like the consumer when it comes to sports right i know um there was also sort of a lot of pressure that led to like changing the nfl some of the nfl names right or like um and so how do you think right like um our role is within that and um what can we do to like better maybe organize or place pressure where where there needs to be yeah, that's, I'm glad you brought that up too. That's something I didn't think about or forgot to mention. But yeah, you see now like there's the baseball team in in in, in Cleveland now and the in the football team in Washington. And it's about about time, right? <laughs> it's been it's been time, it's about time. I'm glad that those names are no longer uh there. But no, I think a lot of it to be fully candid with you. In a day, the purchasing power, a lot of it's driven by ac economics. Um, I think people forget that in the day. I think when I was following more of the Washington football team, their you know, their name now, a lot of those, a lot of their corporate partners were saying, you need to change the name. 
it was their corporate partners. We were going to stop. We're not going to be sponsored of the company um, if you don't change your name. So in the day, yes. Like, so whether it's from the consumer side, the corporate side. So there's role, once again, that can, us as consumers are with our purchasing power. I mean, we know from Latinx and the Black community how, many pers- how much purchasing power we have. Um, billions and billions. There's so many studies on that already. And so, and then also role corporate society that, there's role, there's role we all can play to put pressure on, on these issues. We have the power to like not show up. Um, so I think a lot of it, I mean, we, we can, we can, that's a conversation the other day about the role of Catholic, the impact of capitalism in our society. But right now we do live in a capitalist society. And so therefore we do know that money and power that drives a lot of decision-making. So therefore, as a result, um, we, 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 we saw the, the name change right before, really quickly before um, I joined this conversation, I was listening to a podcast with Bob Iger, who was a former CEO and chairman of Disney. And he talked about a little bit of that, some decision making and candidly, like it's good business to make sure you have more diverse, you know, voices and amplifying more diverse voices um, into the, to the forefront. He talked about the high, I mean, their most successful film, you know, still was Black Panther. Um, and so just talking about like, they almost, you know, said, yeah, based on data, we probably shouldn't green light that, but no, we knew that it was powerful to have more diversity in terms of, um, you know, um, representation and all those things. And it provided more economic opportunities. So my point is that, yeah, there's definitely a role there too. So thank you for uh, bringing that up. Yeah. Um, I, I know I've, I've really enjoyed hearing all of your answers. And so I think, um, my last question was, uh, picky, really similar to your answer just now. Um, I was wondering if you had any like book or podcast or recommendations for us so, so that we can continue being informed about, um, all of these important issues. And so that, that would be my last question. And then I'll pass yeah. it to me. <laughs> no, perfect. No, I guess in terms of books or anything, I guess for this topic, there's so many books I think coming from this topic. One book I read, my parents gave me, I think when I was almost in middle school, so really young, it was called Million Dollar Slaves. It was by um, a former New York Times columnist, Bill Roden, but he talks about candidly how the dynamics between owners and players and how it's kind of a modern day plantation. But for me, that kind of like, people can disagree, agree how that is because the athletes are making millions of dollars, but there is a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of similarities. And for me, it just opened my eyes more and I was 13 when I read it. So Million Dollar Slays, it came out, I think in 2003, the book, so it was a little bit outdated, but I would love for him to write like a 2.0 version based on the recent efforts of Naomi Osaka and Ka- Colin Kaepernick kind of seeing where those are. But so those are probably, that's like the major thing. I just finished reading Will Smith's memoir actually called Will, so totally not sports related, but a very, very, very good read. I'm a big Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and Will Smith fan. So it's a very vulnerable book about his life and relationships and it, it's really powerful. So I heard it's a good audio book too, because in his voice. So for another kind of lighthearted, just a random book, I, I just finished that earlier this week. So uh, really powerful. Thanks so much for those recommendations. I'll, I'll for sure check those out. Um, and thanks again for just engaging in this conversation. Oh, thank you. you I'll, I'll pass cool. it over to Cindy. <laughs> oh, thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Crystal. You did a great job moderating the questions and asking questions. And Dexter, thank you. I think one, you. one of the things that really comes out clearly, and I would encourage all students as you're looking for a job, is follow your passion. Yes. You spend a lot of time at work. So follow something you're passionate about and you'll, you may find those passions in places you never thought or being able to work on the, the issues you care about in air, at, at places that you never thought were working on them. So um, Dexter, again, thank you. Um, thank, thank you all, I really then. appreciate it. Yeah, um, our next um, Young Leaders in Public Service is scheduled for February 23rd. We may do one before that, but it's gonna be with Eugene Kang, who also is a former, um, uh, Obama White House special assistant, but he's now working for an advisory company. And the thing that's interesting is that there's actually, he's mentioned in a story in this week's Michigan Daily, uh, oh, when, he, when he was an undergrad, he actually ran for city council. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, and he only lost by 95 votes. Um, oh, I do know that story. I've definitely yeah. heard of him. That's right, that's right, yeah. Right, mm-hmm. right. So, um, and I know Eugene's really excited. Um, to come talk to students. I have to tune in for that. No, but thank you all for having me. Even I'm not a forward, a 40, I think you all call it. I'm a, always a big advocate. So, um, but thank you all for having me. It's a privilege and honor. Go blue. So thank you. You're, you're a Wolverine. I have to tell you, yes. you, so you were the coach or you were a student coach when um, John Beeline was coach. And yes. when he spoke here one time, he told us a story that he'd always bring 
um, recruits and he they'd ride up on golf carts and come up and they'd he'd point to the Ford building and say, hey, do you know who that this Ford school's named after? He was sort of testing them. And uh, he's a big history guy too. He's a yeah, big, big history. history. Unfortunately, big. many of them said Henry Ford, but then he had to make sure that they knew it was Gerald. And Ford. I and I was I talked to I was talking to Andrew, uh, Andy Beeline the other day as well. I know it was a, a, a forty as well. So him yeah. and our, we we t we talked the other day actually. So yeah. great. Well, thank you. Thank okay. you all. Have a good one. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.